let me introduce my panel. Uh, I have uh, Ramji Raghavan, a distinguished guest, founder and chairman of Agastya International Foundation. He believes that he needs to build a, a India of tinkering, uh, problem solvers, and creators who are humane, anchored, and networked. That's what he believes in. So, welcome, Ramji Raghavan. I have Nikita Vinkani. Am I promising you right? Okay, thank you. So, Director Youth Program, Quest Alliance, working with the domain of youth, especially, and creating meaningful learning experiences. That's what she is into. Thank you. Welcome. Vinny, Director, help your NGO, a Chartered Accountant, uh, support non-profits to scale and achieve better outcomes. So, that's where she works in. And finally, Ravi Chawan, a good old friend, working with Deshpande uh, Educational Trust on Skill Plus program. Welcome all of you for this program. We are here to have a very unique conversation on impact through partnerships. This is a, a thought that we have in our mind and Deshpande Foundation also is looking forward to work on it. It means to say that we have a lot of programs that make impact on the ground and how do we optimize, uh, you know, make it sustainable, scalable, and once it reaches that point where we can scale it, we want to get it off the ground and take it to every other place that is possible. So in doing so, one of the biggest limitations that comes in is basically our own capacities to implement or make it work. That's where the partnerships come into play. And this panel is going to discuss the very basic facts or the directions in which partnerships can work and how we can take it forward and can we make an impact or not. With that, brief note, let me just put my question first to uh, now Ramji, you are the most wisest of this panel. So please give us an indication into how you have worked and how did Agastya come into picture and what are the key you know, notes that you think we should be taking into account. So wisest, by wisest I assume he means Oldest by a long time. <laughs> but actually, uh, he stole my thunder because I was going to say, the longer I live and the more panels I participate in, the more conscious I am okay. that my fellow panelists are growing younger and younger as I grow older and older. <laughs> uh, be that as it may, it keeps me younger yeah. to be with younger people. So. In terms of partnerships, when uh, my colleagues and I started Agastya back in 99, just imagine that I'd come back from uh, living abroad for over 20 years, had virtually no networks here, uh, had a lofty dream of uh, making, you know, helping create a creative nation and all the rest of it. So how do you even start? And what I stumbled upon out of necessity was that there were a lot of retired people who had tremendous knowledge and expertise and experience that were not being tapped into. And so I began to tap into them. And I did it because the people who were working did not necessarily have the time to talk to them. Whereas the retired people uh, actually were delighted to speak to someone about their own life and experiences. So I began to have a series of what I call curiosity conversations. And through these conversations, I created a network of about half a dozen extremely eminent people. People like the former chairman of the Atomic Energy Commission, Engineers India, the former principal of Rishi Valley, a lot of scientists from the DRDO, and they began to give me a lot of ideas and uh, insights which would have taken me a couple of decades to acquire. So it really shortened the life cycle of, you know, this whole process of trying to get an insight into the system in the domain that I was in. And I created a whole series of partnerships with very powerful individuals, which ultimately led to a partnership with the President of India, Dr. Kalam, right? So uh, I think one perhaps counterintuitive approach to partnerships, because we all talk about 
institutions and you know connecting with this company and that company and so on is that there's a lot of cognitive surplus flying around the system can you tap into that and convert them into valuable partnerships so that was one the second is these conversations uh, made me think constantly in terms of scale and you see scaling ultimately is a mindset it's not about what you should do, what you shouldn't do. Those are things, obviously, you need to follow. But it's about a mindset. And in interacting with people like Iyengar, my father, K.V. Raghavan, and so on, I began to think in terms of how can the system change? What systemic changes are needed? How do we, if you like, raise the level of the ocean by a millimeter, as opposed to filling a glass with water? So that became embedded into the Agastya way of thinking. Scale, large impact, and that mindset is terribly important. To give you an example, when I went to talk to the government of Karnataka, with whom we have a phenomenal relationship, and they've helped us scale the work, the Commissioner of Public Instruction then, Baligar, said, look, Ramji, I am responsible for about, at that time, one point two crore children. Now, if you're going to come and talk to me, talk to me about solutions that I can use for 1.2 crore children, because that is his mindset. So you need to talk that language, right? And then, of course, come up with workable, feasible things that can actually make that happen, which is an altogether different kind of thing. So scaling this has been very helpful in us scaling as an organization across the country. But now we face another challenge. It's about scaling the organization fine, but now we want to create a 10x or a 100x impact, which means converting the scaled organization into a movement. Now that we are talking about scale in a completely different dimension, right? And you have to think almost uh, in a diametrically opposite way to the way you thought when you thought about scaling the organization. So those are a few points that uh, if you think they're wise by all means, <laughs> but you don't have to be polite because my hair has turned gray. <laughs> no, not at all. I think the audience is the judge of that. Thank you. But very, very wisely said, I think these are very uh, clear-cut statements that you made uh, between a movement and an organization. That's an important element that we need to keep in mind. So, uh, coming back to uh, Nikita, so what do you think on the same lines? I think um, <clears throat> I'll start with maybe what we do at Quest so that whatever I speak about partnerships, you know, there's uh, kind of a context. So, uh, as, as Quest, uh, which is a not-for-profit uh, organization that started out of Bangalore about 15 years back, uh, I think what brought a lot of us, uh, you know, initially together was the whole disgruntlement with the way teaching learning processes happened in some of the best schools uh, in the country. If I could claim that I went to some of the really good schools and colleges through my life, I had the privilege. But the joy of learning and how much learning, we, uh, how much of relevance we found in learning uh, was always a question all of us were. And I, and I did really well in my studies, you know, that probably that's the reason I went to some of the good colleges as well, because I could have the marks that were needed. But the joy of what was being taught was really not there. And I think, hence, uh, what really brought us together as people uh, you know, who work at Quest is really how do we reintegrate that joy of learning in the learning processes, whether it's schools uh, or whether it's vocational training organizations, uh, whether they're government-led, whether they're private sector. So what could enable that curiosity, that relevance uh, you know, in the learning processes? And how do we make young people self-learners? Again, when I say self-learners, I don't mean that you need to learn by yourself using an app, but how do you drive your learning journey? So that's kind of the mission with which we work uh, at Quest, which is enabling self-learning for young people so they can drive their own socioeconomic growth in the way they like. And hence, the ability to think with your mind and uh, you know making informed decisions is, is, is the core at what we do. And to this end, you know, we. The name itself, Quest Alliance, comes from the fact that we believe that if what you were also talking about, if we were to bring about large scale impact or even work towards creating movements, uh, no single organization can do it on their own. 
and hence the idea of starting as an alliance up front and being very intentional about how we grow and what we do uh, right from the beginning and partnerships being at the core of our work was very important and hence what we chose to do uh, since the time we started is kind of work with two ecosystems extremely closely. One is to work with schools, the other was to work with government vocational ecosystems. So again, the idea was not to start our own schools or start our own centers, but see what government is doing, what other organizations are doing, and if there is a way we could strengthen some of it. So today, we work sort of, you know, in a big way with government schools uh, across the country, uh, in almost uh, 12 states, where we work on how do we instill STEM mindsets for young women so that, you know, we can nudge more and more young women to go into tech careers. That seems to be the flavor of the conversations and also, you know, a big emerging sector in many sense. And, you know, I was talking to a lot of people yesterday here as well from all over the world. The number of women in female, the female labor force participation itself is so low. And if you look at number of women in technology careers, it's, it's so dismal, right? And that really starts with the fact that women just don't even have exposure about STEM thinking, about careers, you know. So how do we enable that early on when, you know, girls are still in school? And similarly, the other big program that we work on is on uh, on vocational skills. So for example, we have about 3,000 government ideas, another 12,000 private ideas in the, in, the, in the country. But we still continue to have such a big issue of skills uh, and, you know, unemployment continues to remain very high. And a large part of that problem is the fact that vocational training organizations focus only on technical skills. They don't focus on what would really enable the transition of that young person from actually the vocational education to work, world of work. And those set of skills is what we focus on in terms of life skills, how do I even know what my career calling is, financial literacy, digital literacy, has almost become like life skills these days if you were to find any job. So those are all the aspects, right? And the idea is that how do we really keep partnership at the center of all of this and strengthen what's out there and bring solutions that could help strengthen what's out there. So yeah, I'll stop there and maybe go back. I think that's a lovely you know, detailing that you kind of mentioned. Out. So I, I, I come back to you know, uh, Vinny. So you are working with a lot of NGOs and you support them. Uh, in terms of technology, as well as in terms of how you want to achieve the outcomes. So could you uh, enlighten a little bit on that? Sure. So um, let me start with, uh, you know, ex let me start with explaining what Helper NGO does. So in one line, Helper NGO is basically a one-stop solution for any individual or company looking at supporting vetted Indian NGOs across India. Uh, so we started off as a database of NGOs and we have over 700 NGOs listed with us, Pan-India, working across all of the 17 UN Sustainable Development Goals. Over a period of time, we also started offering CSR consultancy services, NGO due diligence services, etc. But all of these are labor-intensive efforts. So currently, while we are working on building the NGO database and getting more non-profits on board, our efforts are focused on the technology-driven solutions that we have. So there are two products that we have which are technology-driven and most importantly focusing on partnerships. The first product is called the Systematic Giving Plan, STP, which is conceptualized on the big SIP. So all of us know what SIP is. We are probably, most of us are already mutual fund investors. Radha earlier was talking about, you know, our students approach her and talking about mutual funds. So, uh, very similar to SIP, SGP basically encourages mutual fund investors to uh, contribute a percentage of their investment to vetted NGOs. And Hingo, which is the second tech product that we have, is a more broader product. It's a SaaS that we are offering to companies and individuals. So, while SGP is focused only on mutual fund investors, Hingo is the broader product wherein any uh, you know, individual or company can support vetted NGOs. These are both plug and play mechanisms, so any company that approaches us can easily adopt it. There is no cost of implementation. Uh, we have all of the back-end mechanisms in place and it's as simple as placing that Hingo button on your company's website and there's a whole seamless you know, flow that happens up. Oh, that's wonderful. It's slightly technical, I guess. Yeah, yes. But trying to understand, I mean, uh, this is a platform where 
a lot of the NGOs are listed. Yes. Okay. Okay. So Ravi, I come back to you. Okay. Uh, you are a grounds up person. I think you know how to handle a partner and how to reach out to a partner. So what do you think is your mindset and how did you go about it? Uh, let me talk about first uh, from where I come, what, what, what is the program yeah. I work. So I think most of you were there yesterday in the visit. You had been to a skilling center and, uh, and you met a few students. Right? So I, I belong to a skilling IU and uh, we got a two variants. One is uh, we call one is skill plus R where uh, we used to uh, get the students post their college graduation degree. After graduation they come here and they spend some three to four months and they get a, a assistant for their uh, uh, placement. And another variant is uh, we work in the college, the same program, our, our successful program we have, we, uh, we have taken to colleges and uh, we, are uh, we are operating from there. Now, a uh, very interesting thing is, uh, first uh, seven, eight years, we were operating from our own campus. Uh, you have seen the beautiful campus we, which we have. And uh, after doing some seven, eight thousand people uh, graduation and assisting them into the placement, uh, we were so uh, so happy that we have done something. Uh, that is what we wanted to do it. But uh, uh, but uh, we quickly realized that how big is the problem? What is the size of the problem? And what we have done it. Even the the, the thing what we have what we have done by doing the, some seven, eight thousand is not even creating a dent on that overall pro, uh, big problem. We know a big number, I, I think I, I, I don't have to talk about numbers, how many people from different states or let's look at only North Karnataka, how many people are graduating every year and how many are directly employable from the college. So there's a big gap between uh, graduation and employable. So uh, that was the thing. So what, what we thought, this is not going to be uh, 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 possible to do everything from the residential what we do and this is not in a cost this is not a possible that's not a, scale, a scalable model uh, uh, if you look at so after working for seven eight years we perfected that model and we thought we want to do it from there and there we required a collaboration and uh, when I was looking at the uh, uh, collaboration uh, from the outside always college appeared to me collaboration is not possible with the college with the any institute like Deshpande Foundation who wants to go there and work and assist the students for the placement. That's the end goal, what we have. And uh, that was the first initial impression we are having. But when, when we go, gone inside the problem, when we started working with the colleges, what was appeared to us was not there. Even we have that ecosystem, that, that uh, understanding with the colleges that people who's getting graduate from their college, they really want to, uh, not everybody, but very very uh, few colleges, they want to make sure that the people are employable, that basic competence is what required to earn the uh, entry level job, they really want to give that. So for that, what was the thing? Collaboration, I was talking, yes, they say collaboration, we exchange MOU and everything happens, but after that what? We have to run a program, because those people going to be in the uh, college for a year, how we are going to run that program and without having that uh, clear uh, 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 engagement activity list with us, we would have been not done that possibly, uh, uh, possible for us to do that for 100 colleges. This year we are working with 100 colleges and initially first year was very difficult for us to work with colleges. They were not even allowing for us to every day for two hours of class to conduct. Project over, projects were not there, computing lab was not there. Whenever we want to take class, students were not available because they are engaged with some academic classes. So there were many challenges for that. This is a very small collaboration which is supposed to happen between a, 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 a skilling institute and a college. That was the difficult thing appeared to us. But once we started working with them, so once you enter the problem, once you define the pro problem and prepare a engagement activities for them, after working two years, we have, uh, as of now, around 3,000 students and 100, and 100 and plus colleges in Karnataka and Telangana and Andhra Pradesh. So, uh, this is the uh, uh, model which we can really scale. Now, after scaling, uh, means after having a collaboration in North Karnataka, now looking at the bigger picture, how we are going to make things in the at the national level. Now we are looking like, we are this year we are experimenting with the Maharashtra, 
and and we are very hopeful that uh, we would learn out of that we don't want to see the problem sitting outside we really want to get into it means we want to give a try to it and we will take it and we are very confident that that ecosystem is there those kind of people are available at, at all the part of uh, india and definitely we will progress on that i, I think well, I, I think ravi you, you mentioned it right hardcore from the bottom <laughs> It is coming from your heart, so yeah. As I belongs to, a, a, I come from uh, Grok. So these are the live things which I see every day to day operations. Yeah, that's wonderful. So taking it from that, I think I'll come back to you, Nikita. So what do you think? I mean, what are the key things that we look at uh, when you have partnership? The fundamental challenges, and how do you kind of get over it? And I would like to pose the same question to. Ranji as well. How did you make that a moment? You know, there are different kinds of partnerships. We have partnerships with some state governments, Karnataka, Haryana, Maharashtra, and so on. We have partnerships with the Triple IT in Hyderabad. Uh, we have partnerships with the IIT in the Indian Institute of Space Technology. So there are different partnerships for different kind of objectives. We are partnering with a company in Mysore about developing VR and AR applications in education in order to scale. So in each of these partnerships, obviously, you know, in, in partnership, you're looking for synergy. You're looking to address what objectives that partner has, which might be different from yours. But if in the process you can find synergy, then it's fantastic, right? So you go about doing that, and then you, you build those partnerships, and you have to address the other partner's objectives. The challenges are, you know, often partners have certain expectations, you'll proceed at a certain pace, uh, it could be slow or fast, and you're not working at the same kind of pace. You have some key individuals running these partnerships, and they leave for whatever reason, and things can come back to square one. But fundamentally, especially in India, which tends to be relatively low trust, you have to build trust with your partners that they can count on you. If you have that trust, then you can overcome a lot of obstacles, right? So the, there may be a technological fit, there may be all kinds of fits, but there has to be a cultural fit and a trust that this person actually will deliver the goods, or at least will attempt to deliver the goods to the best of her or his ability. So the trust element is something one should work on, you know. So uh, the rest of it is, you know, you can almost read a book and get, get a checklist of things to look at. But uh, if you want to create a movement, somebody talked about losing people. Now, if you're losing good people in an organization, that's a bummer, right? But if you think that you're trying to create a movement, which means you want to inject the system with your philosophy, then actually losing people is a good thing. Okay? So you would actually encourage it. In other words, you'd redefine yourself, not as a, an organization with a slightly fortress mentality, but almost like a university where you say, I need a core group of people who are really committed to my cause and who would stay on. The rest of them are almost like students, the majority. They will come, earn their degrees. Yes, we will have to reinvest time and money, yes. But then we're doing it with an objective of infiltrating the system. So you would actually want to see the people who work with you moving into the larger system, into the government schools, for example, and taking your philosophy forward. And they become very good customers for you as well. So uh, when you think of a movement, you do that. The other thing with the movement is, are you scaling the organization or scaling the idea? Okay? In Agastya, our mission is curiosity, creativity, confidence. Okay? A simpler way of saying that is, ah, aha, ha, ha. Now, if that is our philosophy, which it is, firstly, it's easier to understand. It certainly brings a few smiles to people. Even children I've seen can relate to the mission, which is very important. Because in scaling, one of the biggest problems is, how do you know 
the frontline person, is actually enabling that. And in most organizations, there is what I call an exponential decay of vision. To avoid the exponential decay of vision, you have to articulate your mission in such a way that is easy to understand and that hits people here and here. Right? So that's another very important part of scaling and more important for a movement. I've heard people come and tell me and they have nothing to do with education, they're not school kids. <laughs> I heard uh, you or somebody else in Augustia speak, and I've internalized the ah, ah, ha, ha, ha mission because it applies to me in my work, in my life. So those are all important, uh, almost subliminal parts of the scaling to movement kind of evolution. Thank you. I mean, well said. It's a very interesting pointers that you make. Okay. So Nikita, up to you. Um, I think uh, agree to a lot of what uh, Ramji said. Uh, I think just to add a couple of things, I think two kinds of partnerships that are very integral, uh, you know, and what I've seen very closely uh, in the last 15 years. Working with government obviously is extremely gratifying because it gets you to the largest scale possible uh, and it gets you to the, you know, the, the most unreached as well. But I think some of the things, uh, you know, in terms of you can definitely work with the government very closely, demonstrate a lot of good things, but when it comes to them adopting some of the solutions and which actually then leads to systems change when those solutions are institutionalized and adopted, that leg of work is extremely tiring and requires extreme amount of patience. Because one, I think, you know, with the government, people keep moving, people keep shifting. So, you know, when you just think that, you know, you've, you've hit the nail and this is just happening and, and it's time, you know, the officers have moved, some new person has come in and there, you're like back to square one, trying to figure out, you know, the alignment on goals right from the beginning because that again becomes one of the most critical things, right? Like the priority alignment in a partnership and having a common shared vision to things is, is where I think it takes a lot of energy. So that becomes a really critical thing. And I talk about some of the hacks, you know, that we've learned, learned over the years in terms of how, how we do it uh, in our work. But that's definitely, uh, you know, one of the, one of the you know, challenges in terms of uh, working with government. I think the other thing is, um, you know, when, when I talk about working with, we have about 50 not-for-profits who are also our network partner. And we also like, you know, work on building a strong knowledge and innovation community. But again, you know, aligning on common uh, solutions. Oftentimes, you know, when we see that, you know, if you want to come together for a knowledge exchange, oftentimes you realize that, you know, a problem is so complex that there is no one thing. And I think somebody was again talking about it in the morning. I think Desh was saying that in order to transform a village, there are hundreds of hundred of problems in the village. Now, one can of course say that I will work on one problem and I will just, like, I can't help the other 99. But what you can do is to find other experts who know the other 99 problems, bring them together to that platform. But that exercise of bringing people together to that alignment and coming together and working and building on each other's expertise, again, intentionality of investing into that process takes a lot of effort. And oftentimes, the way the solutions are built, they're not very easy to replicate, right? They're built in a certain context. They're built in a uh, for a certain audience. But when you have to take the same model to multiple states or to different kinds of audience, that scalability and replicability sometimes becomes a problem. So how do we productize? Again, something they was talking about in the morning. That how do we look at more and more products which are easily re replicable, adopt uh, adaptable by more and more people? I think those are some of the challenges that we see when it comes to partnerships for scale. Uh, but yeah, there have been some interesting ways we've been able to solve, but I'll talk maybe after. Yeah. I think that's lovely. I think uh, really good. So, uh, I, as, a, as the conversation was going on, I heard a certain point that it takes a fair amount of energy to maintain a partnership. Am I right in uh, understanding that? And what would be your comments on that? Uh, I'm talking based on my uh, experience. Uh, managing a partner, 
uh, when you have done something, uh, a program or a anything on your own, everything you are doing from end to end, you are doing it and you are reaching a uh, phase where you need to a partner and, 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 and we jump into it. And there will be a situations where <coughs> uh, uh, when you are working anything on the partner, who will take the credit? Who will take that credit? In, uh, in a two, two organizations or two individuals are working, who will take that credit? And that's a that's a most important situation for any organization to to take a pause and think and 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 take a decision. What was the so important thing for any one or any one partner in that is a credit or a impact. What is the most important thing is the impact. So I think there should be a, both or one person should be one organization should be saying yeah I let it go. Let my partner, my my partner take that credit, but I would be so satisfied, uh, overwhelmed by the impact. What is going to happen now? Same situation with the Maharashtra. We are looking for a partner, and these all the things we are discussing day to day. We are going and identifying partners to to run our program at the Maharashtra region, and these are all the questions day to day we are getting, and and every day our thought process is getting changed. Every day something is learning out when you work something something how we how we are operating at our uh, place that might not require that so though we should be little be a little open flexible adaptable to give that freedom to run the program and more impo uh, more priority to the outcome means impact that's what my uh, take Any other? yeah so um, if i may add uh, trust, transparency, credibility, uh, you know, all of that is extremely important, of course, alignment of goals. But I think most importantly, because we're dealing with some donors, I feel it's really important to follow the bottom-up approach. So a lot of time donors come to us and tell us that, you know, I'll, I'll actually give you an example. We recently did a menstrual hygiene management program in rural Rajasthan. And the donor told us we want to do, uh, we just want to distribute sanitary napkins near our factory premise. So after a lot, and, a lot of back and forth, we did some sensitization activities with the women in that community. And we did the program because it came from the management and we just wanted to use the CSR funds. But on follow-up with the beneficiaries, we found out that the program was a complete fail because the women there did not even have the undergarments that they need. So we redid the program, and now obviously we are scaling. But you know, this is just an example that it's really important to do a need assessment before you actually uh, you decide on what to do, and de definitely follow a bottom-up approach. Thanks. On the same question, the energy. Yeah. You know, uh, the many factors. The higher the trust, the lower the demands on your energy. So let me give you an example. Rakesh Junjunwala was a great partner of initially mine and then Agastya Foundations. Not once did he come to audit Agastya. Okay? And he has given us, probably gave us close to 100 crores over the years. Not once did he come to audit. Now, should he have audited? Why not? It's his right. But he made an assessment based on trust. And the trust had to be constantly renewed. Because you can't take anyone for granted, right? So, uh, we always demonstrate through our work, inviting him or his representatives to the grassroots to see what we are doing, to see something in action, what he heard from other people about what we were doing. So, that kind of thing then, any other partner who had given us a hundred crores, I would have probably had to hire 20 people to just meet the partner's financial reporting requirements. But that was not needed. Now, a completely different situation with the government of Karnataka. Okay? Very different organization. Rakesh's decisions were based on just talking and suddenly he'll say, I'll do it. That's it. No one to consult. Right? Karnataka government is a large government and the early years took us a lot of time. Now we've been working with them for about 14-15 years and I remember one of the secretaries when he took over, he said, Agastya, I know them, yaar. 
They're almost like our furniture. I don't need to question them on basic things. But monthly we report, we have to follow through all the due diligence, invite all the local government officers to our center so they can see from time to time what's happening. Be visible and show what you're doing, the good, and if you've run into problems, discuss them. So there are different ways of working with partners. The other thing with partners is view them as a source of innovation. Going back to my cognitive surplus thing. You may be partnering on something, but you get to know them and you brainstorm on some other things and some new ideas happen. So the partnership actually becomes a source of innovation for you. New ways of thinking. So uh, they can be very, very powerful and not just take energy but actually contribute energy. Yeah, I was, yeah, I mean, I completely agree with uh, everything uh, Ramji said. I think just to add to, you know, some of the things in terms of what has since been our learnings, you know, in terms of how we've dealt with partnerships and how to sort of, if I could call them good successful partnerships. I think for me, one of the things that we've kind of, you know, been reflecting upon as an organization for the last couple of years is the fact that if we were to really truly believe in collaborative action, which could actually lead to movements and large scale systems changes, it's something we want to invest in. So to that end, for example, we started something called a Future Right Skills Network about two and a half years back, with the intention that if we were to look at working with large scale government systems, especially on the skilling side of things, we need to get all of our stakeholders aligned to that common vision and mission, right? So that the energies are not dissipated in 10 directions, but they're converging to a common goal which can actually bring a shift, right? Because for movements to happen, it needs to be large scale and a lot of people need to come together for that change, right? So I think, it, and you would see this as a very sort of emerging trend of working as collaboratives uh, across the board, right? So I'm a part of another collaborative called the Life Skills Collaborative, where the core vision is to say, how do we talk about the life skills education at the core of the learning ecosystems and it really brings together some of the best organizations from across the country which focus on the vision of life skills and get them to actually co-create solutions and you know then each of the organizations goes works in their respective ecosystems with the governments they work with with central government state governments with the with their circle of influence of smaller organizations schools colleges whatever right and these are the things that create movement so that alignment in terms of being able to get people together on common vision and really investing in collaborative action by really, you know, making it it very visible. Like it's easy to say that we have a network of fifty people, fifty organizations, but having a network called the Future Right Skills Network, which is converging to how do we bring about large scale systems change in ITIs in the country, which brings donors together. Uh, we have about four donors who invest in it. We have about 10 not-for-profits who are a part of that collaborative. We have about 12 state governments which are a part of it, including the central ministry, which also sort of, you know, is aligned to a lot of the goals that we work with. So that's like one of the things that we've really, really invested in. I think the other thing from a, from a scale perspective, I think is to be able to build replicable solutions. And I think that is why technology plays a really critical role. So when I spoke about the fact that you need, you know, more young people to be trained on 21st century skills for them to be really employable, then how, what kind of solutions are we creating, which can not just be used by us as an organization, but can our solutions be used by hundreds of other organizations? Hence, how are we packaging them? How are we productizing them? And how are we making sure that we're putting them out in the public domain under potentially a Creative Commons license, which is then is available to a lot of people, right? So that intentionality of being able to create public goods and being able to create products. And hence, like, for example, where technology becomes really critical from a learning standpoint is that somebody again spoke about teachers in the morning. I completely agree with the fact that no teaching learning experience can be humanized without teachers being an integral part of it, but also the reality of our country today is that we don't have the best of teachers. And especially when you move to sectors like vocational skilling, if you look at you know the vocational ecosystems, they don't have good teachers. And that is when if technology products and solutions can enable teachers to do what they do better and simply and in an easier manner, that, that brings about 
a, you know, a large scale shift into things. So I think investing in some of these kinds of products which could aid teachers, which could aid learning, where learners can also learn on their own, because for everything you don't necessarily have to go to the teacher. You could learn certain things you know, on your own and then you could actually go to the classroom and talk about what you learned, reflect upon what you learned, right? So that process itself gives a whole bunch of learning. And just the last thing and I'll stop, I think the third thing which has really made us, make the partnerships work for us is to really create a level playing field. I think when there is a lot of hierarchy or power dynamics into partnerships, we do run into problems, right? So when we have a more equal partner, whether you're working with the government or whether you're working with donors or whether you're working with other practitioners, I think being able to create that common value, being able to create that level playing field and being able to create that respect, I think that really creates good partnerships. So yeah, I think those were... Thank you. Fairly said, uh, Nikita. I think uh, very wonderful discussion with all the four panelists. I want right now to open this forum for the questions and answers if there are any. Uh, please state your name and we can have about four to five questions max. So please keep it short. Yeah, hello everyone, my name is Mandar from Prash Foundation. So my question is, when the organizations are small in size, then the quality gets maintained. Because you sit together, you interact, the foundation is quite strong, the capacity building is there. But slowly, slowly when organizations become bigger and bigger in the size, then the quality gets hampered. So how to maintain the quality when you become bigger in the size? Why I'm asking this question is because I'm from a CSR front. And there are organizations who tell us that we are based at Karnataka, we are based at Maharashtra, but we can work anywhere in India. You just give us the funding. So I told them that, uh, you, do you know the context? Do you know the geography of that region? Do you have any rapport of that particular area? No, we can work anywhere, sir. We, can, we will hire the people and we can work anywhere. This is the approach nowadays. So while doing the partnerships and while when the organizations become bigger and bigger in size, how to maintain the quality is my question. Whom do you want to answer? I mean, address to whom? It's a very, very important question. And uh, today we are about 1,500 people. And uh, we expanded at one time, and even now we have set a goal of reaching 100 million children in the next 10 years. Obviously, as somebody in my team before coming here, I had a meeting with our staff here at our Hubli Science Center said, aren't you worried that quality is going to go down? And yes, when you scale, and when you scale fast and rapidly, and we did exactly what these guys are saying to you they would like to do, we did that. We continue to do that. So my answer was, yes, I'm aware that quality can dip. But unless the system is stretched. I will not do what is needed in order to reverse the dip in quality. And when you do that, you begin to institute new ways of monitoring, controlling quality, which you wouldn't otherwise have done. So when we expanded rapidly, my COO came to me and said, I'm worried about quality. So we said, okay, we better do something. We created a quality assurance team, an internal master trainer team. We began to brainstorm. We came up with new ways of quality assurance and control, which would not have happened had we not expanded so rapidly because we felt the pressure, right? So there are systems and processes that we have developed, some of which I think are unprecedented at the grassroots, right from how to run a class, because as we speak, there are about a thousand classes going on around the country. I guess they are classes. How do you know the teacher is spreading the mission? So we put in systems and procedures and ways of monitoring. They're not perfect because you get bigger and bigger. But you can do it, one. The second, and this is very important, is the motivation of the people working for you. Reason quality slips is former uh, Dr. Kalam's successor, Atre, told me, Ramji, at that time we were about 100 people. You're fine. I guarantee you when you double or treble, the number of people who are going to have the same motivation is going to be a very, very small percentage of your total. So how do you avoid that shrinkage? Everyone is not going to be as motivated as, you know, uh, 
the most motivated person, right? So that's where you've got to create an environment through the way you articulate your mission and the simplicity of it, where people who join you and work for you believe they're doing something of vital importance, in our case, to the nation. Okay? There is a story, and I'll stop. When John Kennedy in 1960 or 61, at a famous speech at Rice University, talked about putting a man on the moon before the end of the decade, in 62 he visited NASA. And as he was leaving, he saw a janitor. And he looked at the janitor and said, uh, Hi, I'm John Kennedy. What are you doing? And the janitor responded, Sir, Mr. President, I'm helping to put a man on the moon. <laughs> right? The janitor believed that by keeping the place clean, disciplined, he was creating an environment where the scientists and engineers could work more happily, collaboratively, all the stuff we've talked about to help put a man on the moon. So your target should be how to get the janitor and the sweeper in your organization to understand your mission in the way that they want to interpret it. It may not be, they won't talk about exponential decays of vision, right? In their own way, they must feel that my work is helping Agastya or whichever organization to put the equivalent of a man or woman on the moon. If you achieve that, my friend, 80% of your problems are taken care of. Ranji sir and Sarita represent the buyer group of companies in India. You spoke of public-private partnerships. I seek your wisdom on how do you get private-private partnerships on board. I'm struggling with other corporates joining my programs. Uh, so when I speak about my programs, the AHA movement is created. It doesn't go to AHA or AHA. So, some yeah, thoughts. Let's see. The problem with a lot of uh, uh, what, you know, you need to understand because it's context dependent. I can give you a general plain vanilla answer, right? But that's not, I'm not doing you a favor. You've got to understand exactly why those things are not happening. Are you talking to the right person in the organization who can make the decision, right? There are gatekeepers, there are decision makers, there are influencers. So who are you talking to, one? Two is, are you talking to them in terms of, firstly, have you understood what their objective is? Okay, we all understand what our objective is, if we've got it right. But very few of us understand the other person's objective. What is the other person trying to achieve? And how do you fit in what you're doing in terms of showing them in their language how they will achieve their objective? Very important. I learned this in 83. I was a young banker in Puerto Rico. And I was in charge of electronic banking for Citibank. And we would go around talking about the features of our system. Then we were sent on a training program that IBM at that time was the big blue. They would train us on how to sell. The IBM guy took us to a restaurant, really nice restaurant in Miami, and called the waiter and said, take us through the menu. The waiter started reeling out the menu. In about three or four minutes, all our eyes were glazed, and we couldn't remember a single thing. Then the IBM guy said, stop. What are the main highlight dishes here? And the waiter said, well, that depends on what you like, sir. Seafood, or you like chicken, or you like this, or vegetarian, whatever. And then he just focused on the highlights. And suddenly, we were all more engaged. And the IBM guy said, I rest my case. So what he said is, you guys, when you're selling in Citibank, Ramji and your team, you're selling on features. OK? Start first with objectives, then benefits. 
finally talk about features. And I think that is true even today, 40 years later. So understanding the partner's objective, most of us don't spend enough time. Mea culpa, I don't either. Because I say I'm busy and how am I going to understand what his or her objectives are here? It's taking too much time. But that is critical. Who you're talking to, understand their objectives, talk in their language. These are just some suggestions. Maybe you've already gone through it, but we can have an offline conversation. I just wanted sorry. to add to what Ramji was saying. Sorry, uh, just to uh, you know respond. I think a very lived example of what Ramji was talking about. So, for example, what we do is an annual fund a collab, which is not you know at the time when we have to do our renewals of the year and all of those things, right? The idea is to actually invest in dialogues and you know really alignment of vision. So in that entire day that we spend with all, so one we bring all of our donors together in one room uh, you know and a lot of times people ask us this question that is that is this a regular practice because a lot of people don't do that they want to keep their donors away from each other because you know sometimes people would feel that there may be some influences etc but we've been doing that as a practice for like at least six years now as quest and i think the entire conversation there is that what is the change we want to see in this country and hence where are all of us aligning and if all of us continue to stay stuck to our goals and objectives and our only ways of doing it, it's not going to happen. Right? So that investment in that dialogue has to happen very intentionally year on year, right? And that actually gave birth to the Future Right Skills Network where three of our donors have actually pulled in funds to work on a common vision and they had to do some amount of letting go of their own approaches, their own states, like this is the only state I'll work in or this is the only audience I'll work in. They've, they've really aligned and come together. So I think that part of what did, what does it take for vision alignment needs an investment, it needs continuous conversations, it needs persistence, it needs effort. So I think if we again do that intentionally, I think it, it really works and I can tell you that it's really worked for us. So I just wanted to add to what Ramji said actually. It was a learning curve, exactly what you said for us. So when we launched Hingo and when we were talking to corporates about Hingo, we were first highlighting the features of Hingo, showing them what's in it for them, right? No cost of implementation, seamless donations, you are co-funding your CSR projects, etc., etc. But then we realized, but let us at least explain why we, are, why we work so hard on Hingo. What is this technology solution? That's when we first up front in the doc, uh, you know, in the deck, started uh, explaining what's the objective of Ingo, which is building an endowment for NGOs so that it creates a steady stream of flows for them and supports them over a long period of time so that they don't have to worry about fundraising and, you know, focus on the work that they're doing. When we started talking about this vision and this objective, that's when corporates, you know, started like liking the idea and started engaging with us. So, yeah, exactly what you're saying. I mean, that's the learning curve for us. You know, try and find the hot button. Easier said than done. We all have hot buttons, but no one else knows. Maybe my wife, of course, she presses them all the time. So she knows my hot buttons. But good and bad. Now, if you, if you try to get my attention, and uh, all you have to do is... I read a book by J. Krishnamurti. It was this, what do you think? You'll immediately get my attention because that I respond to it almost viscerally, because it goes back to my childhood and my admiration for the man. And then after that, if you say, can we talk about doing something? Have you got a more willing listener? Yes. So if you have the time or you have the savvy to divine somebody's hot button, I think that will be the secret sauce to anything. I mean, by the way, if you find out, let me know. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, my name is Nayak. I'm part of the foundation. Uh, this question is to Nikita. Uh, Nikita Desh always keeps telling us about uh, one issue we have in the not-for-profit is that we don't have a complete customer loop, unlike a for-profit, where your customer rejects you or your competition takes away your customer. Uh, we don't have that situation in the not-for-profit. So, so now when my question to you is, when we work with partners and try to impact the end customer or the beneficiary through a partner, uh, the customer is going further away from what we have been currently doing. So, and I know West Alliance is working largely through partners. So how do you manage to get your end beneficiary feedback 
even though you are actually delivering impact to a partner. So I am keen to understand that because we want to be going on that journey. I'll attempt and I'm sure there'll be other people join. So I think a couple of things that comes to mind, right, in terms of the practices that we follow. I think one, um, we need to have very strong feedback loops. So for example, if you're partnering with the Ishpande Foundation on some of our digital content uh, and blended experiences, I think for us to be able to, you know, our content teams especially who are really building some of these solutions to be regularly going to the partner sites and collecting solutions and again I think with sorry uh, feedback I think with technology uh, you know a lot of the monitoring of quality has become a lot easier because earlier you know we would have to go everywhere maybe conduct FGDs go sit in the classrooms to see what's happening but now if there is a way that you have observers so even let's say if, you know we're, we're building solutions that are being used by the Ishpande Foundation if we could give you a monitoring framework or you know a quality control framework using with which you could give us feedback saying this is working or this is not working and this is the feedback what needs to go back and shift things. So I think that process building is important and investing in that whole feedback loop uh, is important and I think technology makes it a lot easier. The other uh, thing I was going to say which is now slipped my mind, <laughs> uh, I will Come back. <laughs> I forgot what was the second point. No, no, fair enough. And I thank you. Uh, I, I just want to say, by the way, we have had an outstanding partnership with the Deshpande Foundation. Yes. Since I don't know, I guess 2007 or 8. And uh, you know, it's one of the best partnerships we've had for the record. Yeah, last question. Yeah. Vivek from the Foundation. Uh, uh, Ramji and uh, Nikita and others, you all have did your kind of created solution, productized it, and given it to your partners to implement. But how did you come to know what needs to be hardened in the productization? What needs to be at least soft, which can be customizable from the customer point of view, region point of view, and delivery point of view? And how did you come to that? and offer conclusions. Okay, uh, basically, you know, starting from first principles, any star business has to fulfill two things. One is there has to be a gap in the market. And the second is there has to be a market in the gap. Okay? Now the market in the gap could exist or you can create it over time. So you need to go and find out what is the gap in the market. Now, if you're lazy and you're not able to find out, uh, you're never going to be able to create products in the first place or services because you, you don't have the domain knowledge. I remember P.K. Iyengar telling me when I started Augustia, look, we live in a copycat culture. This was 1999. A lot has changed since then. For God's sake, don't create a copycat organization. Create new ways of doing things that the rest of the world will come and say, wow, we would like to know how you did it and we'd like to use this, which to a large extent we've done. And that happened not because we're all so brilliant, but because we said, let's go and try and understand what the gap in the market is. Walk into a village, look for some asymmetry. Or sometimes it's just the power of creative brainstorming. So it could be anything. Have open-minded curiosity. The products begin to come. The services begin to come. Now, in our case in education, by and large, the needs are very similar. Because we are addressing basic human urges, curiosity. The need to want to find out is a very basic human urge. Now, how you do it, whether you do it through storytelling or hands-on science or something else, that's different. Uh, the need to want to create something. Most of us want to be able to at least say we created, but we may not know what it takes and so on. Uh, the need to want to be confident. You know, my father used to tell me, confidence is half the battle. So these are sort of almost human emotions. And so when we cater to those, 
inherently there is widespread applicability to what we do. Now you may have to tweak it. If you go to some places, you may have to speak in their language, relate science concepts, for instance, that we teach through hands-on learning, to real-world problems that they face. You'll have to make those connections as part of the augmented product or augmented service. So there's the core product or core service. There's the augmented one, based on the inputs you take from your people all over the country or from other sources. You begin to augment it, tweak it, give it different words because people respond differently to different words in different cultures. There are certain things we call here in the South, give it a name, we can't have the same name in the North. They relate to it slightly differently. So the packaging, subliminal as well as the actual tangible thing, uh, needs to be tweaked. There's a lot of nuance, but you can't have a thousand flowers, you know, because then it will become unmanageable. So you have to build that balance, which you can do over time. It's, uh, but the key thing is, create a culture of innovation, so that there is something you have to package. Otherwise, there is nothing for you to try and even package and tweak, right? So you, you've got to learn to innovate and do it continuously. I think it's a lovely answer, but uh, we have run out of time. Uh, we have some time outside to have an informal interaction, so we can go ahead with that. But I'd like to thank the panel from all the audience here and from the Ishpani Foundation for a wonderful session. It was a lovely conversation. It's just a starting point on impact through partnerships. I think we are learning. We will learn more and we will invite the learnings that have come in from the discussion and we'll take it forward. Look forward to meet you sometime later and have a good day. Thank you. Thank you for the wonderful discussion. Uh, we'd like to request Vivek, Mr. Vivek Pawar, CFBF, to please uh, present the members to our guests. Can you please just uh, stay down for some more time?